works. Okay, hello everyone. I'm really happy to be here in Amsterdam and uh, to participate in the conference, to speak here. And the topic I'd like to speak about today is uh, embedding language into a string interpolator. So what is all about? Well, we have a language, for example, uh, is it visible? Anyway, I can do uh, anything with that. Maybe we can. Okay. Okay. So, for example, we have an English language, and now, wow, we can embed it. Okay, language is embedded. Thank you. Uh, and uh, actually, the thing, uh, because we love Scala, we love Scala for many purposes, uh, for many reasons, but uh, one of the things is that Scala is a really extensible language, and string interpolation is one of the features which uh, is not a kind of magic from the language, and we can easily create uh, their own interpolators and use it. And because it's a function, uh, it is not only about strings. We can return anything we want and use it. Uh, so, uh, some time ago, I participated in a project, and we use uh, MongoDB as a primary database, and this led me to create a Mongo query library, which provides an alternative API for MongoDB, and uh, this API is based on string interpolation. Uh, so, how many of you are using MongoDB? That's cool. Anyway, I'd like to make some uh, short introduction to MongoDB and uh, about the solutions we already have in Scala to use it. So, uh, MongoDB is a document-oriented database. Uh, their documents are uh, stored in collections. And uh, the documents are it's a BSON documents. You can think about that like a, a JSON. Uh, there are some differences like additional data types and uh, the, usually we don't write the quotes around the field names. And so uh, here's an example from MongoDB shell. We have a collection called people and they put in there an object. And we can put one more object uh, with phone numbers, or we can put uh, the object with address, and the address is uh, another object inside this one, and we can put some more objects. And you see that uh, the set of fields are slightly different, because the database is schemeless, so we can put anything in the same collection, um, but usually it's not a good idea to have a really different objects in the same place, but it can have little differences. And the, uh, the cool feature is that uh, Bison is not only the representation of the objects inside the database. Also, it's a query language. So uh, when we want to find the data, uh, we can put a kind of uh, template object into the find uh, statement, and uh, we can f just find the person with name John Doe, or we can add uh, some MongoDB operators inside of these uh, objects and uh, find uh, everybody who younger than 30 or uh, everyone who has phones. And uh, we can do the same with delete operation and uh, for update, we're also using Bison, just putting there two uh, documents, one for matching and the second one for updating. And the most complex operation is aggregation, of course, and it introduces the idea of pipelining, so we have uh, a number of transformations in the array, and uh, it's applied sequentially to the data 
For example, here we grouping the objects by the age field and counting them to find how many people of each age is in the database. And then we sorting these objects by the count field and limiting uh, output by five elements. And that's it. So it's everything you need to know about MongoDB in your life. And uh, so what we have in Scala, uh, there are several drivers for MongoDB. The first one is Casbah. It is synchronous. It implemented on top of uh, Mongo Java driver. And uh, actually, it just adds some uh, Scala way features to the Java driver just to have options, uh, Scala collections. Uh, everything we uh, like to have in Scala, usually. And the second one is Reactive Mongo. It is uh, it's asynchronous. It's built on top of Akka. It provides futures, play iterates as a result. Uh, and the last one is Tepkin. It is also... Uh, reactive one, but it builds on top of Arca streams and uh, it, uh, it represents the collections like as sources and sinks. And uh, it is not supported in my Mongo query library yet, but uh, I think I will do something with that. So let's check some code. So here's the example with Casbah. So each time we need to uh, create a Bison document, we are using uh, Mongo DB object factory method. Uh, and it takes a key, uh, list of uh, key value pairs. So the values can be a plain objects, or it can be a collections, or it can be another objects. And uh, the same idea with finding, or uh, also it provides a DSL to simplify the things. Uh, for me, sometimes it's not uh, really easy to understand and a bit weird. For example, the last statement, because, because of that function with size, and uh, the else, also, there are no DSL for aggregation. So then you are, have to aggregate. Uh, the, since aggregation is the most complex thing, there are a lot of objects and a lot of nested objects. And you know you have to uh, write MongoDB object, MongoDB object, MongoDB, OK. <laughs> Uh, and Reactive Mongo provides the same approach, just the class called uh, Bison document, and uh, well, you just uh, combining these Bison documents. And uh, the project I mentioned before, uh, well, we have a, a front end site on Lyft framework, sorry about that, and uh, Kasbah, and the backend site on Akka and Reactive Mongo. And so in the same project, we have to use different API. Uh, and uh, if we'd like to debug uh, some queries, we have to write Bison documents in Mongo shell. So it's actually, it's uh, three languages for the same thing. And I found that uh, it would be nice to have a facade for this stuff. And then I thought about that. I realized that I really don't want to create one more language. What I really want, I want to put Bison in Scala. And, uh, well, uh, Bison, for me, it seems it's not really applicable for DSLs. 
And that's the reason why I decided to use a string interpolation for that. So let me show how it uh, looks like. Uh, so here's the example with Casbah, but uh, if you use a reactive Mongo, the difference will be it's a different package, a different import, and um, but uh, okay, the interpolator called MQ. I don't spend a lot of time on naming, <laughs> and you just write in BSON, and you can embed uh, the uh, references to the variables, and. I'd like, uh, I have to admit that it, it is not really the same thing you have in Mongo shell. Okay. Uh, the reason is uh, because uh, uh, MongoDB operators are started with uh, this dollar sign, you have to escape it with one more dollar sign. Just because the interpolator have to uh, we'll, we'll think that it's a reference. But it is only difference uh, I have with uh, real Bison, so it can be used with find or, or update or aggregate or whatever you're using. And, and that's it. I, so uh, now Let's check what is inside of this thing, how it works. And uh, so, uh, how actually string interpolation works? Uh, well, uh, when the Scala compiler found some uh, identificator or follow it by uh, with a uh, string, it tries to find the method with same name in string context class. And uh, uh, this means that you can just uh, extend the string context using uh, implicit class to uh, add your own interpolators. For if we already have a parser, we can just put it there. Or uh, and get, get the result. So. Uh, well, if uh, the object is, uh, well, the string pass it to the interpolator is uh, like this one, uh, the, we can obtain the parts of this string from string context. Uh, so the parts is the, uh, everything before the name references uh, reference and uh, everything after that. And uh, the Arguments will be a reference to this name. Uh, the problem, it is not uh, really can be used because it's a runtime thing and we don't really want to uh, have uh, an exceptions because of typos in our Bison uh, strings. It's, it's even worse than writing uh, MongoDB objects many times. And what we really want, well, uh, as Scala developers, we want to check everything at compile time, always. And uh, it, it means uh, that we have to use macro for this. So we c can uh, rewrite our uh, interpolator with macro, so just going macro implementation, so we have to change the argument type to wrap it into the expert and uh, change the result type. And so you see that uh, uh, this uh, function doesn't have a reference to string context, but it's not a big problem. We can uh, just obtain the uh, the parts of the uh, string uh, from uh, the prefix tree. So we can pattern match uh, and get the, the trees 
parse and then create object. So let's check what is uh, there in the parse method. So, well, since we already know that uh, uh, these parts are just uh, strings, we can uh, again use pattern matching to extract the string, uh, put it into the parser, and if uh, parsing calls uh, succeed, okay, they, we get an object. If not, uh, well, we can j just now call the abort method of uh, macro context, but uh, uh, we'd like to put uh, the error message in a proper place. So uh, I had to extend the reader class for parser because uh, they have uh, several strings for one thing, and now I can get uh, the part in the, uh, there it was failed and uh, calculate the more or less proper position of this failure. And so uh, how I parsed that? Well, I used Scala parsers and uh, I found that uh, it's easier to have uh, two steps of parsing, so lexical and syntactical, uh, because uh, we haven't this complete thing. So on the first stage, I just uh, uh, produce some tokens, and in the places where I'd like to have a variable letter, I put in a placeholders. And at this time, I already can check if the keywords are correct, and if not, it's, we can not parse it. Uh, so then we can create a, a kind of object. It's an intermediate structure using and if you're not going to have a different backends, maybe you can produce the uh, the object you need uh, at this stage. But uh, since I have a se uh, have to support uh, Casbah and uh, Reactive Mongo, I used it uh, the, this intermediate structure and then convert it to the uh, proper type. And the So how, what we can do with this object? Well, uh, because it's a, just a tree, we can traverse through it, and we need to wrap each uh, value in key value pair, uh, and that's it. So we can create, a, we can call this MongoDB object and have uh, the code we had before but uh, without uh, writing it manually. So now, uh, if we find, so how we wrap in the values? If we find a placeholder, we can just take the next one from the iterator. If we found uh, another object, we recursively call it wrap object. If it's uh, some kind of uh, additional data type of uh, what we want to insert there, like uh, Mongo object ID, well, we can handle it here. And if it's a, a collection, we have to uh, map and wrap all values inside of. And uh, else we can just uh, think of, okay? Uh, well, I thought it uh, should be in the same order. Because well, maybe, but theoretically, you could write a parser that uh, sometimes, look, uh, sometimes looks to the right and then to the left. You can see what I mean. So, what I'm getting at is that a 
final cap placeholders include references to the arguments immediately. So that you don't have uh, this Bison placeholder, but Bison placeholder of an argument. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, I see. Yeah, may, maybe it might work, but uh, since they already have parsed object and it's... Uh, ah, you mean that I, I can switch fields inside this object? Yes, yes. Oh. Well, just because I am <laughs> not doing that. <laughs> okay. And... Well, that's it. So... Uh, Some words about type safety. Well, actually, the uh, MongoDB API we already have, it takes uh, pairs of uh, strings and any. And uh, you see, the, uh, I already used a lot of reference to any in this code. And, well, as Scala developers, we don't like that. And we want to have something to help us not and uh, well I have a such feature it's a it's a, an all one interpolator it's called MQT because it's type checking and uh, assume we have a model for uh, the data we storing in the MongoDB it's pretty simple, so we have a phone number and we have a, a person with a list of this, which this uh, phones and name and the age. And uh, well, when we are inserting this data or uh, getting it from the database, they already have a solution. So if you are using Reactive Mongo, it have a, a writers and readers and you can use macro to generate these uh, classes for your model and you just uh, should to pass the proper type to your find statement and you getting the your model classes and for Kasbach there are now library called Salat and you can also serialize and deserialize your model classes. But for querying, well, you you can create uh, case classes, but uh, I don't think you'd like to create case class for each uh, kind of query you have. And, uh, well, what I have for that, uh, well, I added the type parameter to the interpolator. And now it can check what, uh, uh, for example, here, if uh, the age field is uh, really in the uh, person class or if the uh, number is in the nested object. And if it's not, if uh, we make a type or uh, using uh, something in an incorrect way, for example, the uh, we trying to use name as uh, an array. Well, it uh, will not compile. Uh, and I like to say a lot of thank yous to the guys on uh, Scala user Google group because uh, they uh, helped me with this solution. And so, well, what is inside? Uh, the interpolator itself doesn't have the type parameter, but we can uh, return a wrapper object uh, with a apply method which have this type parameter and then call the macro implementation. And uh, so now we have no arguments in the, the <laughs> macro implementation function, but uh, still not a problem. We can do it the same like they do for the uh, parts of, uh, of the string. So we can just use pattern matching again, get the uh, uh, arguments, get the string parts, uh, use parse and uh, wrap object, but between these 
two phases. We can add some additional checks to check the field names or maybe the type, so uh, whatever you want. So the check type, well, it's not actually what I use, but uh, just to have an idea how it can be done, well, you can just get the uh, name of uh, fields in the case class and check if uh, uh, this field is uh, present if, and check if uh, each of the fields you have in your model classes is present in the real class. And if not, you can just uh, uh, abort the mm -hmm. compilation. And uh, I'd like to s say some words about testing of this stuff. Well, for the uh, success cases, it's pretty simple. Well, you just pass the data into interpolator, get in the result, and check if it's uh, uh, if it's equal to the, your expected result or not. Uh, but uh, what if you would like to test uh, the failure cases? So w you want to check uh, how your interpolator works if the, uh, they, uh, for example, for me, if uh, Bison was malformed or if uh, MQT fails or this stuff. The problem is, uh, since we are uh, calling uh, context abort, the, the code is not compiled. So we cannot just write some uh, incorrect uh, BSON here and check it. So we have to use uh, the uh, toolbox uh, so we can obtain it from the runtime mirror. And, uh, well, we can create some function to just to get the uh, messages from the toolbox exception. And now we can just check if we have an expected error or not. And, uh, okay. Uh, let me summarize. So, I'd like to start with uh, minuses of this solution. So, well, it's not really easy to implement. You have to write your own parsers to handle all of these arguments, uh, create tests, and uh, this stuff. And uh, if you are using the ID, I think you use, and uh, it will not be highlighted, it's just a string. So uh, is it worth it? Well, f I think yes. Uh, not for all cases, of course, but if your goal is to uh, use a language which uh, already exists and you'd like to preserve this language as much as possible, well, for many cases I think DSL is not the uh, way to do it and the string interpolation can help you. So the reasons is, it is there are less limitations on the language and so as a result, you can preserve. And the last reason, but not the least, uh, if you was yesterday uh, or the day before yesterday on the Martin Andersky speech, he told about uh, string interpolators for the XML. You know, Martin will not suggest you to do bad things. So uh, string interpolation is cool. And that's it. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please. Uh, so there's, there's a question about choice for uh, the UI, so to speak, uh, to express the queries. So 
currently you're using string interpolation, but as you said, since your target language includes dollar, you have to escape them by double, right? Uh, so have you considered this option that instead of MQ and then call something, you say <coughs> MQ, then open parenthesis, and then the string literal. So that you won't have string interpolation anymore, but you will have just a magic function that's called MQ. And it can also be a macro or, or a Well, in this case, I have to do all of the the more st stuff uh, by myself. Uh, I think the thing is that uh, string interpolation is, uh, uh, helps me and it works uh, and don't, don't need to parse uh, this completely. But yeah, maybe, maybe it also works and okay. I, I'm not sure the, which is easier to implement. Anybody else? Okay. So when you run a macro, you can get back the position of the error inside the string. Can that be reported? Uh, so, so if a particular part of the parse string has got an error in that, do you see that in the compilation error? Yep. And so what's the question? Uh, wh why I have to do that, or? So in terms of when you see the error, how much information do you get? Oh, well, it uh, depends on your implementation. So for, for Mongo query, it's, uh, well, it's shown their, their parsing was failed. So, so if, for example, it exp well, for, uh, here in the test, you see, so, we're expecting the colon between the, uh, uh, the test and five, and we get this message. So probably you're wondering uh, where is the position of the, uh, the, the So there was uh, one slide about this. It's probably in the very beginning. Well. Yes. Yes. The position where the parser was failed, plus, so it's offset from the beginning of the part. And Well, it depends. Uh, in most cases, parser reader have a pretty accurate position under their uh, place it uh, really failed, but sometimes it have uh, some offset from that point. So. Well, if there are no more questions, let's have a coffee or something like that. Thank you, guys.